Okay, thank you very much. So, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the joint meeting of the scrutiny committees. So, firstly, I need to run through some housekeeping. In order to conduct this meeting in a safe manner, we ask that all attendees remain seated except for comfort breaks and that social distancing is maintained as much as possible. Attendees are asked to wear masks when moving around the building, however masks can be removed when seated. Please ensure that all mobile phones are set to silent. The toilets are located on either side of the engine shed. Public toilets are next to the reception area. In the event of an emergency evacuation, the emergency exits are situated at each end of the engine shed. Please ensure that you follow the council staff to evacuate the building. As per normal rules, if you wish to speak, please ensure that you raise your hand and you will be invited to address the meeting by the chair. If a, <coughs> if a vote is required, all votes will be taken via a show of hands unless a recorded vote is requested, which will be taken in the normal way. As for full council meetings, you have laminated copies of four against and abstain on your table. Four is green, against is red, and abstain is yellow. If you are required to vote, please raise the correct coloured document to make the vote counting easier for the team. Finally, I would remind members that this meeting is being live streamed so please make sure that when you speak, you use your microphone. Thank you. So I'll move on to the first item on the agenda, which is the appointment of a chair of the joint meeting of the scrutiny committees, which is in accordance with part four, section eight, scrutiny committee procedure rules, section 13, joint meetings of scrutiny committees, which states that the chair will be appointed from among the chairs of the committees who are holding the meeting. Those chairs present tonight are Councillor Mohamed Farouk, Chair of Growth, Environment and Resources Scrutiny Committee, and Councillor Casey, Chair of the Community Scrutiny Committee. Can I therefore ask the committee if there are any nominations, please? Councillor Casey? I'd like to nominate Councillor Farouk. Thank you. And do we have a seconder, please? Councillor Sainsbury? Yeah, I second that nomination. Thank you. Um, as there are only two chairs, but are there any other nominations for the other chair? <laughs> no? Okay. So, as, as there's no further nominations, um, can I ask if any of member of the committee objects to the nomination of Councillor Farouk for this appointment? No, I see no raised hands. Thank you very much. As I see no formal objection, uh, could I therefore ask Councillor Farouk to take the position of chair for this meeting? Thank you. Evening all. Welcome everyone to the joint meeting of the scrutiny committees. The joint meeting of the scrutiny committees are meeting tonight to discuss the medium term financial plan 2022-23 phase two proposals document, which is item four on the agenda. This meeting is an opportunity for all members of each scrutiny committee to come together to scrutinize the budget and medium term financial plan as part of the formal consultation process before being presented to Cabinet on 21st February for approval and recommendation to full Council on 2nd of March 2022. To help with the smooth running of the meeting, each section of the budget will be lo looked at individually, 
you will have been sent a running order for the meeting, which I will follow throughout the meeting, taking each section of the proposal document in turn. Questions and discussions will take place on each section, and then any recommendations for that section will be made before moving on to the next section. If you're making a recommendation, please can you be very clear and succinct as to what the recommendation is. Thank you. Please note section 4 to 15 of the running order for this meeting refers to the MTFS plan 2022-23, phase two proposals document to cabinet dated 31st of January 2022. This is a separate document to the agenda pack. You will have already been sent a copy of this when the cabinet agenda was published and again via on 1st of February when the agenda for this meeting was published. You can also access the document via the link within the report at item four of today's agenda at Appendix 1 and through the ModGov app on your Chromebook. Within the cabinet meeting section, agenda dated 31st January 2022. Can I therefore assume that everyone here has access to the documents for this meeting, please? Yep. Please note that this meeting is being live streamed and for the benefit of those people watching the meeting on YouTube, I can confirm that the leader of the council, Councillor Fitzgerald, and cabinet members are also in attendance at the meeting, the chief executive, Matt Gladstone, with members of the senior leadership team who will assist the cabinet members in responding to the questions. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our new chief executive, Matt Gladstone, to his first scrutiny meeting at Peterborough City Council. I will now move on to item two on the agenda. Are there any apologies for absence? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I have received apologies from the following uh, members of the committee. Councillor Ansar Ali, Councillor Barkham, Councillor Elsie, Councillor Fenner, Councillor Judy Fox, Councillor Hasib, Councillor Over, Councillor Skibstead, and Councillor Tyre. Tyler. Sorry. I've also received apologies from co-opted members Peter Cantley, Flavio Vites, Parish Councillor June Bull, and Parish Councillor Michael Sunways. Councillor Shaz Nawaz is in attendance as substitute for Councillor Ansar Ali, and Councillor Dawson, Dawson even is in attendance as substitute for Councillor Skibstead. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Paulina. Agenda item three. Are there any declarations of interest and whipping declarations, please? No. We will now move on to agenda item four, medium term financial plan 2022-23 phase two proposals. Please refer to the cover report for this item and appendix one, which is the medium term financial plan 2022-23 phase two proposal document dated 31st January. Councillor Coles, would you like to make your introduction to the medium term financial plan phase two proposals as referred to in the cabinet report dated 31st January 2022, pages one to 34. Thank you, Chair. Yes, and I, I would. Thank you very much. As I noted at cabinet a week ago, I and I suspect many of the members and staff of the council were unsure of quite what phase two of the revenue budget build for next year would give us. I wasn't even certain that we would be able to propose a budget for scrutiny tonight without further government support by way of a capitalisation direction. However, I'm delighted to be able to present the medium term financial plan for consideration to scrutiny tonight without needing additional support. Before I outline the key aspects of the budget plan, I want to reiterate my tribute to the organisation. The staff have worked tirelessly over the past two months to achieve what is in front of us tonight. And I would like to again place on record my sincere thanks to all of those involved. The senior management team have dug deep to explore the art of the possible with regard to finding the solutions that we have set, sorry, that we have as set out in section 4.2 of the report. The rigor, the challenge and the open and honest conversations are a testament to the ability and maturity of this council to react and respond to the huge financial challenge we face. That bodes very well for the future. As well as the wider management team, I would like to reiterate my thanks to cabinet colleagues who have been heavily involved and the cross-party financial sustainability working group for its continued and constructive contributions. 
And finally, a thank you to the finance team who have orchestrated the process and brought a strategic approach to what we labelled in our improvement plan a tactical budget. The proposals in front of you signal the start of this Council's return to financial sustainability. Of course, in an ideal world, none of us would want to make some of the savings that are listed in Section 4.2. But we have a responsibility to our residents, and with that comes difficult decisions. The budget is built upon maximising our income, delivering efficiencies and managing demand. These strategies will deliver around £6.5 million of the required Phase 2 savings, a total of £12.6 million. And while other opportunities are contributing, we have no option but to make some savings from reconfiguring services such as libraries and other leisure services. That means those services might look and feel different and not offer the same range as now, but for the vast majority of what we currently provide, they will continue. It would be remiss for me not to mention the risks attached to this budget. The budget will need very careful monitoring and control throughout the next 14 months in order that any variances from the budget plans are spotted quickly and recovery plans can be put in place. The main report details the risks and you'll find those in section 6.3 and section 8 and also in appendix D. Section 6.3 in particular references some very specific concerns and those on potential demand and inflationary pressures are perhaps our biggest concerns. The finance team are currently working on papers that will highlight the risks associated with changes to our assumptions on these two potentially significant issues. You will see that we currently have a very small surplus of £276,000 based on the current proposals. However, officers are quick to point out that the estimates included in the budget are subject to change as we go through the next few weeks. So we could very easily see that our surplus turns into a deficit, in which case we'll have to make some even more difficult decisions that are not yet on the table. Within the proposals put forward, we're able to reduce our reliance on reserves by £5.5 million compared to our budgeted position at the 31st of March 2022. You and residents may well ask, well, why are we putting money away while at the same time proposing an increase in council tax and having to make some changes to services, even if only for a year? In response, I would say that getting the competing priorities right in setting the budget is a difficult balancing act and it is as much an art as it is a science. Professional judgments are crucial, not just from the finance team, but our other statutory officers whose job it is to ensure we protect our vulnerable children and adults. We believe the proposals you are considering tonight have balanced the competing priorities as well as possible given our limited resources. Looking at the capital programme, you will see at the bottom of Appendix C that we must reduce the programme by some £28 million over the next three years. However, that will still leave a programme of some £160 million to be spent on our roads, on schools, on housing and on schemes such as the New Towns Fund and our university, as well as a range of other vital infrastructure projects. The £28 million reduction is needed in order to deliver a revenue saving of £750,000 and to avoid rising debt costs in the future, which is another key strand to achieving financial sustainability. Ultimately, any budget proposal for any council has to pass the Section 151 officer test. Those tests include making judgments on the robustness of our budget estimates and if our reserves are adequate in light of the risks we face. That is now the role of our newly appointed Interim Director of Resources, Cecilia Booth, who is online tonight. Section 6.3 on page 25 and 6.4 on page 26 of this report provide that assurance, albeit not an unequivocal one. You should be mindful of those assurances and the warnings that are associated with them. Looking beyond just next year, if people were to look back, to, uh, back at previous budget reports, they will see a marked difference to this year's report. We have focused entirely on next year's budget and make no pretense of being able to present a genuine medium-term financial strategy at this stage. Having that medium-term plan is vitally important to our financial recovery, which means it needs to be considered, thoroughly challenged and scrutinised. 
The strategy will need to consider how best we deliver our statutory services and how we do so for the very best value for money. But this Council cannot be just about delivering the statutory minimum. It has to invest in our infrastructure, in our commercial sector, in business and in our future generations. But we have to do so from better financial health than we have now. Colleagues, I'm delighted to be able to present to you with a proposed budget for 22-23 that reflects our number one priority for the Council, achieving financial sustainability. Thank you very much, Chair. Do we have any questions, please? Councillor Sanford was first, I think. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've actually got two questions. Would you like me to ask them all in what one or ask them separately? Uh, if they're related, yes, ask them straight away. Otherwise, if there's a bigger list, then you'll have to ask them. Uh, OK, right. The, 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 um, the first question is, is actually about the improvement plan. Because at the Cabinet meeting that agreed the um, corporate, corporate the, ag agreed the um, medium-term financial plan. In the resolution that was passed, the cabinet agreed to, ag agreed to the improvement plan. The problem is that the improvement plan that they agreed to is not the improvement plan that was agreed at full council back in December. If you look at page 12 of the improvement plan, there are five bullet points under the governance um, section. And he, whereas in the, um, in, the, in the one that the cabinet agreed on, on January 31st, there's only four. And the key one that's been taken out is the commitment to a full g g governance re um, review. Now, w why this is problematical is that one of the reasons that the Liberal Democrat group agreed to support the improvement plan was because it contained this commitment to a g g g governance review. So I would like to ask the Cabinet, is that commitment still there? And, and if it is still there, why, why, did, why, did, did, why did, did it not appear in, in the plan that you, that you, that you, that, that, that you, you, uh, you, you uh, agree? Who would like to answer that? Councillor Fitzgerald? Yes, and somebody made an error. Simple. <laughs> It's, it's a fairly substantial error to, to actually omit one of the crucial points about the plan. And Councillor, Sanford, so. Councillor Sanford, I don't type the documents. Mm. So if you want to pursue that line of questioning, it will only embarrass officers, not me or the group. So I've said yes, and it's obviously an error. You have that undertaking from me in the FSWG group. Nothing has changed. Does it not indicate, though, that the Cabinet agrees things at Cabinet meetings without actually reading what you're agreeing, which I don't think is a very healthy situation? Shall, shall Do, does it not we... also follow that Council members have every opportunity to study the Cabinet papers before they go to Cabinet and make representations to the Cabinet that's an error? So if you want to pursue that line of questioning, you can point the finger at this, every single this, member in this, here. Apologies. This is a minor point. If, if it's been omitted, it's going to go back in then, obviously. So shall we move on to your second part of the question, Councillor Sanford? Yeah, my, 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 the second question that I have is in the corporate strategy, which is also printed in the budget p p papers, um, it, on, on page... Um, nine of the corporate strategy, it says that one of the things that the Cabinet is committing to is to, to de deliver on our commitment to make the Council's activities net zero carbon by 2030 and to support the City of Peterborough in achieving that. Now, I've looked very carefully through the budget proposals that you've presented, and I remember raising the points repeatedly at the Financial Sustainability Group that that actually implementing this doesn't necessarily involve additional expenditure. It could involve just not spending th 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 things on, on certain things and transferring that expenditure elsewhere. So can you tell me what in the budget is, is actually aimed at achieving what is actually in the corporate strategy? Uh, there are two, par two parts to that question, Councillor Sanford. One, I don't think you have made any specific proposals about alternatives that you claim there are. 
And again, I'll put the challenge back to you in our next meeting if you have specific pro proposals as the chair of the improvement panel pointed out to you when she read that same comment in the paper that you particularly making those comments have not actually given any examples of those savings or different ways of doing it. So we would welcome to hear your alternative options about how you might do things differently. And I would ask you to bring those to the next FSWG group so that everybody can consider them. In the wider sense, there is a lot of work going on about climate change and our net zero carbon targets. Andy, did you want to add anything, or do you want to bring Kirsty in uh, for any specific examples within the budget? Thank, thank you. Councillor Day? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm looking at page 10, uh, the December Budgetary Control Report section. Uh, it's right at the bottom of the section. So it says that some of the proposals have been included with a target saving rather than a saving that is fully supported by a detailed delivery plan. This is far from ideal, but it is a necessary approach in order to protect services as much as possible. Other proposals include some one-off opportunities which cannot be repeated in future years and will therefore need replacing in 2023-24 with ongoing savings. I just wondered if we knew sort of what the total was of these one-off savings. I'm particularly referring to the one-off savings. Uh, and what is the plan to replace them in 2023-24? What, what on ongoing savings are we going to replace those with? Thank you. Thank Councillor Coles. Kirsty. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, there's a table on page 14 that shows you the one-off savings of 1.2 million, and we are looking at replacing them as part of the medium-term financial strategy that we're looking to um, pull together, ready for September. So it will, the savings will be part of that plan. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Boyce. Thank you, Chair. It's just a point of clarification, please, if I can ask. On page 15, under the council tax breakdown, it has a section for parish precept of £657,300. The total council tax budget figure is then transposed into Appendix A. I just want clarification, as that's shown as an income, where it's actually shown as an expenditure, because that figure is collected by the City Council and then given back to the parish councils. Thank you. Kirsty Nutton, please. Yep. Yeah. So exactly as you said, um, we collect the we collect the council tax um, in terms of the parish councils, and it will be in the resources line in Appendix A, page thirty-five. Thank, thank, thank you, Kirsty. <coughs> is, is that is that okay, Councillor? So I didn't really hear the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So. Can you hear me now? Is that okay? Yeah, microwave a little bit nearer, Kirsty. <laughs> Sorry. I'm softly spoken. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Is that okay? Yeah. 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 Okay. Absolutely. So as you said, we do collect the council tax on behalf of the parish precepts, and it is paid out under the resources line in Appendix A. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Councillor Joseph. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, obviously, we've got the moratorium on capital spending, and we've got things like the cuts to trees, where no pun intended, where that's going to be, um, you know, held off for another year. So I wonder if we thought about the effect of um, basically kicking the can of these things down the road, because you know, obviously, prevention is better than cure. So are we actually not opening up a can of worms next year or the year after? Um, and also, we, with the uh, expected rises in things like um, petrol and fuel, et cetera, and so forth, have we budgeted um, in their variance for these particular um, th you know, rises in the cost of living that obviously even as a council we're going to have to um, look out for because we have to heat the buildings, et cetera, and so forth? Um, and my third question, uh, going back to what the leader said about um, as the, old, the opposition not coming up with any ideas. I'd like to know what ideas uh, the administration's come up with because we're repeatedly told that all of these ideas are from officers. Thank you. 
I'll deal with the last point, if I may, Councillor Farouk. And also, I would just like to clarify just one thing, and I'm sure Pippa will pick it up in the minutes. It will be reflected in the Cabinet minutes what we actually agreed. I believe that paperwork for the Cabinet was already published before the final negotiations, right up until the day before, about your inclusion, Councillor Sanford, of the governance review. And I would add, everybody in this Council could have come and pointed that out, but I know what we agreed at the meeting also took into account because the Chief Executive specifically mentioned it to me and we agreed it. If that needs uh, adjusting in the minutes or it will be captured in the minutes of the Cabinet meeting and the paperwork updated. What we've done, um, Councillor Joseph, is actually we've actually stopped certain things going through. We've stopped the closure of the Citizens Advice Bureau. We've stopped the closure of the museum. We've stopped the closure of Flag Fen. We have stopped so many things from going forwards in terms of those savings because we have a regard for services. Like all these things, we're guided by officers. And I genuinely say to you, whether it's in this forum or whether it's through your members of the FSWG, come up with some things. This is a collaborative council budget, not a conservative budget, because the conservatives do not have a majority on this council. Therefore, it is our duty, all of us, to do this. So we are constantly working on proposals with officers on the budget, and you're invited to do the same, as has been made clear when I established the FSWG voluntarily. Yep. Th thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald. Can, can I, word of warning, can we just stick to the MTFs FS today uh, and not worry about whose ideas and how many ideas and which ideas go which way? So can I go to Officer Nutton about the inflation? Is inflation included in, or is it Councillor Call you're going to answer that? Inflation yes, thank you, Chair. The, the three questions about the moratorium on capital, tree maintenance and petrol. Um, yes, the... There's obviously a risk in introducing the moratorium on capital spend and on the tree maintenance, and that, that was covered in some depth. We recognise it's a risk we have to monitor, particularly in trees. Yes, there's a potential for, for there being greater costs in the future. That's one of the things we're trying to balance. But if there are any uh, dangerous trees, any health and safety matters, those will be dealt with immediately. Um, similarly, with the moratorium on capital spend, we're having to do that to maintain our budget position, but that is a one-year only. Uh, in terms of petrol, yes, that is covered within the assumptions around um, the costs and the increases in inflation. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you. Next, Councillor Shaz Nawaz. Thank you, Chair, and two questions, if I may. Uh, the first one is an, is an obvious question on page number five, uh, where there's a mention of, obviously, low government funding in comparison to our service needs. Uh, I'm keen and interested to find out from Councillor Coles what efforts he's made with uh, the government personally as obviously uh, the lead finance person in terms of bridging that gap uh, and what uh, assurances does he have from the government that will get uh, fairer funding going forward? Thank you, Councillor Coles. Difficult one for me to answer because the whole process has been to produce a financially sustainable budget short term. So um, recommendations about what we might make in terms of fairer funding. You'll know the review is taking place. It's been much delayed. Um, we are in, not in a position where we can make those representations until such time as that becomes available, which will be in a year or two. But you can bet your bottom dollar that when it's an opportunity to make representations, then that's what we will do when the fairer funding regime changes. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Coles. Second question, if I may, yeah, very quickly. Of course, of course. Uh, you mentioned quite rightly uh, that part of our role, uh, Councillor Coles, is to invest in the local infrastructure, businesses, uh, local economy. Uh, and again, I agree with you that obviously we need to be on stronger footing in order for, for that to happen. Now, that could be two years, it could be three years, it could be four years. Uh, so from now until then, what are the kind of key risks and concerns in your mind about us not making those investments and what do you intend to do to mitigate those risks? Thank you, Councillor Coles. I'll do my best to answer one of those most difficult questions, which is what's going to happen to the economy in the next year or two and how that's going to impact on the business sector. Of course, the um, Council's got a very strong reputation for bringing business into the area and we've been very successful in bringing good businesses and uh, investment. And of course, the way we get into a situation of greater f financial sustainability is to improve all of that. Thank you, Councillor Coles. Do we have any more questions? 
Councillor Casey. It's really just, just one about inflation. And reading through the document, are, are we basing all our um, judgments on 4.1% going forward? And are we looking at three or three or four percent and, and sort of the pr widening the parameters so that we can actually do an INW analysis of, um, of what was potential? Thank you. Yes, Kirsty, uh, could you just give an idea about the, the complexities of the assumptions we're making? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so in terms of inflation, there's not one single percentage that we've applied. Um, we've looked at it in terms of where the costs are occurring, such as utilities and um, recent electricity costs, for example. Um, the council's um, fixed in for a period of term, so the risk is mitigated to some degree, um, and then it will be the phase in thereafter. Um, and then we have other um, areas with market sustainability, such as in adult social care, um, increasing prices. Um, so we've looked at them in specific areas rather than just applying a flat rate across. Thank, thank you, Kirsty. Well, Councillor Sanford, you've got one more question? Yeah, it's not a question. I just need to respond to what the leader of the council was saying because you know, his, his argument about this being a collaborative budget, I'd just like to refer you to paragraph 14.3 of the report that was agreed by the cabinet. It talks about legal implications. It says, in terms of the council's executive arrangements, the adoption of the council budget is a role shared between the cabinet and the, and the council, whereby the cabinet is responsible for formulating the budget proposals and the whole council okay. is responsible for approving them. So, you know, I, I actually made it clear when we went into the financial sustainability group in the, f in the, f in the first place that we, would, that we were quite happy to, to actually comment on, on, on proposals that the cabinet was putting f forward. Okay. But Councillor just Sanford, want to we can't, we no, can't this go really back important. to square one now. We are we not in a coalition and we are not doing this on a collaborative basis. You, we are commenting on proposals that you are pu putting yeah, forward. Yeah, let's stick that to is the, the role of yeah. opposition party. Let's, let's stick to the comments on MTFS for tonight. Thank uh, you. Uh, Councillor Farouk, uh, I think the Chief Executive will clarify the point for Councillor Sanford. Um, although I would remind Councillor Sanford, we're not in coalition. He pointed that out at great pains, but we are actually working collaboratively, and he stated that previously. Um, I think the Chief Executive will clarify the legality over the budget position. Uh, I think just to, just to clarify, B, I have seen a collaborative approach since I've started, and I was involved in several meetings with FSWG before I started the, at the Council during December and January. It is a full council responsibility about setting the budget, so, uh, and that's been set out very clearly by Eleanor Kelly at, as chair of the improvement panel. We've had commissioned reports from DLUC and others, SIPFA, etc., pre, pre last year. And I think it's important that we all take a responsibility about setting a budget. I know it's difficult, and that's we, Councillor Coles has set out, you know, this is a one year tactical budget. We would love to be able to set a more medium-term financial plan. We haven't got that in place at the moment because of the financial issues we're facing at the moment. But I, but I would commend it. It's difficult. It's an inclusive approach. We are taking a, way, a range of views around how we can tackle the budget and the difficulties facing us as an organisation. But I think we've come a huge way in the last few months. And we welcome the engagement and the views coming through. But it is all councillors. This is a whole council issue and approach that we need to tackle. Thank and you. just uh, that was made crystal clear by government to us several weeks ago. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Councillor Wigan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, can I just ask, following on from that, why we're calling it a medium term financial strategy when it isn't? And we're very clearly saying, because that's contradicting in the titles of the documents what being said. I get the point that we want a medium term financial strategy and we would set one ideally. I get all of that. But so why are we confusing things by calling something something that it isn't? I, I might have called that. My apologies. I was no, I mean, it's in the. Sorry, Chair, it's in the paperwork it's and it's introduced paper. as medium term financial strategy. We've referred to it as that, mm -hmm. but we've heard from the um, Cabinet member and from the Chief Executive that it's not a medium term financial strategy. So why are we calling it that now? 
Well, that's, that's the clerical thing. So shall I, I'd, I'd like to move on now. Uh, okay. If I may, I mean, it's a, something of a semantic argument, and what we've tried to, be, to say is that it's, it's a one-year rather than a three-year plan, so it's more of a tactical plan. Um, is a one-year plan a strategy or not? I think, yes, as you say, we could have called it something different, but in fact it is the strategy that we have until we get to the more multi-year plan around about September time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Court. Right, since no further questions on this section, do we have any recommendations? You, Councillor Wiggins, do you have a recommendation? Well, can I put forward that we, uh, going forward when we present this, um, that we call it something that is a medium-term financial strategy and reflects what it is, so we're being clearer to our residents what we're doing, because if we're not clear about what's happening, they're not going to be. Councillor Cox? Could I recommend we call it the medium-term financial plan for 2022-23? Would that make sense, Councillor? Medium-term plan, then, is it? That's a one-year plan. You can't call something one-year medium-term. Would you like to suggest a name? Then we can call it that. Plan A. Can I just comment? I mean, whilst it is a tactical plan for one year, throughout the document, it does have a forward look. So, for example, looking at page um, 28, it looks at the reservist position going forward for the next three years. So it's, it's good practice to look ahead, and we've done that in a number of guises. You know, the questions around inflationary pressures, clearly we are under a lot of strain. That, I don't think, is going to disappear in the next 12 months, so I think we are looking at that being prudent around, around the financial aspect. So, I would endorse it's, it's common practice to have a medium term financial plan or strategy. Um, it is focused primarily on a year, but there are a number of references throughout the document which is looking at actually the next three years and what the position is. Yeah. And I think increasingly that's what we're looking at. And I'm looking at the structure of the organisation, the comments around the economy. I welcome, you know, that's one of my sort of top five priorities is looking at how we strengthen the economy. You don't fix that in a year. You know, there are a number of key agendas. Capital programme is set in the context around things like the university and the plans there. That is set out in the document. That's more like three or four years. So I, I would recommend you, you stick to the uh, medium-term financial plan, in my view. Yeah, and, and, this, and in different places it does refer to 23, 24 as well, so, so it does go through a number of years and in a number of places. Okay, so if there's no further recommendations, shall we... Move on to the next next section. Can everyone note that we are now considering Appendix A 2022-23, 2024-25, MTFS detailed budget position phase two starting on page 35. Would the relevant cabinet member or lead officer will respond to the questions? What do we have any questions on that section, please? Appendix A. That's not. Oh, that's a surprise. Um, yeah. If there's no question, then of course there can't be recommendations. So we then move on to. Can we everyone note that we are now considering Appendix B, Phase Two Budget Proposal Consultation Document, starting on page 37, 37 to 66. Do we have any questions, please? Councillor mm -hmm. Coyum. Thank you, Chair. My question refers to page 46, um, adult social care uh, front door. Um, technology we know is expensive in itself, and we know that it's been stipulated that um, the technology that the council refers to is more um, using equipment such as lifeline alarms, medication reminders and full sensors. What I'd like to gain clarity on is the adult social care front door reference to technology. Is this a different type of technology? Is it the same? Um, and if it's different, has it been costed? Um, and if it is with regards to lifelines, um, we've seen cuts to the budget 
um, previously with regards in reference to lifelines and why are we now reintroducing this as a means to um, help with rehabilitation of those patients? Thank you. I've got another question as well, but that, that's fine. Thank you. Let's answer Thank this you. one, Councillor Kuhn. Who would like to answer that, please? Can I refer to Charlotte Black, please? Yeah. Yes, um, thank you very much for the question. Just to clarify, the point about the front door is that's not really a form of technology. Um, so this is about making sure that when people come into the council and ask for help on a specific um, issue, they come in through what we call our front door, which is our early help, and the proposal is that we could make better use and a better technology offer at that point rather than drawing people into the assessment process. And in terms of the lifelines, um, contract. Um, we've done lots of work on, on uh, basically lifelines as people's personal alarms when they get into trouble or difficulties in their own home. And there's a very good evidence base to support continuing to develop our approach to lifelines and just key part of our preventative strategy, really. Thank, thank, thank you. Did you want to ask your second question now then? Yes, Sorry, please. Yeah. Thank you. So page um, 46, um, the adult social care reablement. So which frontline workers are we actually referring to in the report? Um, and are we investing in more carers? How do we hope to backfill vacancy when we know that there's actually a national shortage? Thank you. So we are talking about developing our reablement service. So the council has a very good reablement service, but we think that by increasing um, the capacity in this service, we will actually be able to avoid cost further down the line. And we're also very clear that that service delivers excellent outcomes in terms of promoting independence. Thank you. Councillor Day. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm on uh, page 49, um, the CCTV. Um, it says that the council operates an excellent network of cameras covering public and private areas. Um, and that there's this proposal to sell the CCT CCTV service to other companies and organisations. I just wondered if there had been any interest in that at all. And will it be one organisation or will it be different organisation that use those different CCTV cameras? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coles. Can I turn to Adrian for an answer, please? Thank you very much. Yes, thanks, Councillor. Absolutely, um, there is interest. Um, we um, have... Uh, Network, a network of cameras, as you know, across the city, hundreds of them um, covering both public but also private spaces. Uh, and just before the pandemic, it actually sold, subject to signing on the dotted line, a number of um, contracts or uh, arranged a number of contracts with private companies. They unfortunately fell by the wayside because of the pandemic. So we know there is interest um, and uh, very confident we can achieve the uh, relatively prudent target that we've set without affecting our core public service duties. Thank, thank you, Adrian. Councillor Knight. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's regarding the libraries on page 50. Um, the proposal looks to remodel and modernise the library service so that it costs less. Um, we already have libraries that are only staffed 15 hours a week. It's got a self-service. It's already been remodelised. Can I ask what um, it's going to entail, please? Councillor Allen. Can I turn to Councillor Allen, please? Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair, Chancellor Knight. Um, we are doing a complete overview of the library service. Uh, that could include the closure of some libraries. It could include the repurposing and commercialising some libraries. It could in involve staff changes. So Councillor Howard and myself are doing an in-depth study of the libraries and indeed referring to each ward councillor as we visit the, ca the ward, uh, sorry, their ward to look at their libraries. We started last week uh, with Warrington and indeed in I and, uh, and Thorny. That was easy because as ward councillor, Councillor for Ian Thorny, uh, I could be on site immediately. <laughs> and, but we're moving on next week to Hampton and I believe Stanground. Um, and we're looking at all the libraries because we need to look at ways to commercialise the library. That's not to take away the service from the community, but to reinforce the continuity of our library offer. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Uh, Councillor Farouk, King. Uh, Councillor Farouk, sorry, uh, just one thing for Councillor Knight's benefit. I, I know Steve touched on it. This is very much also about what ward councillors think. Ward councillors need to input into the work Councillor Howard and Councillor Allen are doing. There's no done deal. This is absolutely grassroots. Tell them what you think, what you feel, what you know on the ground. That's very important. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald. Councillor Kingsley. <coughs> uh, 
Al, Al, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, I have just a query on page 47 regarding children's social care. It's also linked to the social care re re uh, uh, reunification, but particularly in terms of in-house fostering. It's a topic that's been shared at education and children's scrutiny for a, a number of years, and the local authorities made sterling efforts to try and grow the fostering. So the question is really where do we gain confidence that those savings are realistic given the challenges we've faced with quite significant efforts already made to try and bring them back into the local area. Thank you. Councillor Coles. Thank you very much. Um, it's a high risk strategy, of course. It's something that requires work. But Lou Williams, can I ask you to answer that question? Uh, thank you, and thank you for the question. Um, it is challenging recruiting foster carers, um, but we have uh, invested a, a significant amount uh, of time and energy in terms of redesigning our uh, recruitment strategy. Um, and we will have the support of um, external partners in terms of doing this. So this is about looking at different ways of uh, making fostering our fostering uh, offer um, uh, attractive uh, to members of the public and fostering is a great a great opportunity to um, meet the needs of children and young people um, and you know the savings target that's against that which is just in the region of three hundred thousand pounds actually when you break that down should be achievable um, but you know all of these things come with risks uh, we will spend the next uh, we've spent already considerable time developing a fostering recruitment plan we're launching that very shortly and we'll keep monitoring it and can report back into scrutiny as we proceed uh, with that plan. Thank you, Lou. Councillor Kayum, you've got another question? Thank you, Chen. Forgive me, I've got two questions again. I am sorry. Um, again, going on with the subject of reunification, um, my concern is because I've dealt within this area with regards to child safeguarding and actually Peterborough City Council has a very sterling reputation in terms of very little serious case reviews when it comes to children. But in light of children, like nationally, like we've heard, Star Hobson and Baby P, aren't we really raising the thresholds for picking up on red flags in terms of such children slipping through the net and how the, can this be prevented? Will this involve a change in policy, referrals, changing training? Um, how are we going to achieve this realistically with a review? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, in, in brief, we're talking here about getting children back into the families more quickly. Um, Five to eight children is about that sort of saving, but if you would like further detail, I could ask Lou Williams to answer. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Councillor Coles. I was going to make that point that actually with, you know, so we have a very robust um, safeguarding arrangement for children and young people. Um, this is about looking at the way that we can support children back home. Children in care are not a static population. We have children coming into care for a time. Some stay, some return home. Um, if you look at our performance data, we have a much lower uh, pr proportion of children returning home um, from the care system than other similar authorities. So we do think that this is an area that we can explore. And to be really clear, this is, this, this is the same children going home, but perhaps going a bit home a little bit earlier and perhaps with a bigger package of support. We're not talking about fundamentally changing any of our thresholds or any of our approaches to safeguarding. And the decision for a child in care to return home has to be signed off at a very senior level, so either at an assistant director level or indeed in some situations at the director of children's services level. So there are a lot of safeguards covering this particular area. It is uh, called, uh, noted as a very high risk area. That's not about risk to children, just to cl clarify. That is about risk to delivery of those savings because we will be very, very sensitive about how we go about that and we will make sure that children are not indeed placed at any risk. Thank, thank you, Lee. Thank you. Um, that sounds actually very reassuring. Can I ask my second question, Chair? I'll, I'll put you on the list and you follow the next Yeah, two. sure. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Sanford? Yeah, I've got three questions, I'm afraid. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to, f f to, to go, go along with the same pr process. Um, but if, if I could ask my first one, which is about public l libraries, which follows on from the question that Councillor, n Councillor Knight asked. Um, I, I'm actually pleased that the Cabinet is, go is actually going ahead with this, rev this review of the public 
libraries because I, I, I certainly think in, you know the, in in the light of the current financial situation we should be looking at whether we can get volunteers more involved but but I am really concerned because I actually had an email from one of my constituents earlier this week and he was pointing out that Peterborough has got really low educational attainment and and various areas, like in my war in Paston, we've got uh, the, the, the very high levels of social deprivation. So, I'd be really concerned if um, if if the public libraries that serve those areas were to be were to be cut. So, can, can I ask the question um, and, and make it quite and, and sort of ask for a really clear answer? When we get to take a vote on this at full council, will we have clearly before us an actual plan which will show precisely which libraries are going to remain the same, precisely which ones are going to change, and, and precisely which ones are going to, are going to close? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Sanford. I mean, the short answer is yes. We are doing a deep dive into the uh, libraries because each library is very different and each community is very different. And what we're ascertaining is the value to each community and where they can be improved, uh, contained or developed. So I have a, 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 an assertive answer. Yes, we will present that. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Steve. Councillor Nawaz. Thank you, Chair. Question in relation to uh, culture and leisure. Uh, it says on page uh, 49 that the total VAT and business rate relief savings are between 500 to 700,000 uh, pounds. Could I have clarification on how that's broken down, please? Well, Councillor Colts, did you hear that question? Sorry, I think Councillor Allen might want to come back on that. I think it was a misunderstanding. I think Councillor Coles asked for, will he have clarification by the budget setting meeting? The answer is no, you won't. And we clearly laid that out in FSWG because the review will take six months to complete. But will, will we know exactly what is, sorry Councillor Farouk, uh, it was a misunderstanding I think. Um, will councillors get to agree an input into changes into the library service. We've made it clear, Councillor Sanford, and you were at the same meeting, yes, you will. But that goes wider than the FSWG. It goes across all councillors. I think, Councillor Day, you, you know I said that. It's going to take six months. So they're indicative savings. And, and I have to say, and I'll also be very clear, if we can't make the savings, then the savings won't be made. We will have to look for savings elsewhere. So nobody is going to close the libraries without agreement amongst all members. But I don't think we can do it by the budget because it's going to take six months to do that review. I just want to be perfectly clear but also say to people you will have full input into those decisions. And if we don't make the savings of 700,000 they will remain in the budget and we'll have to find something else. I hope that clarifies that. And sorry, I don't think you did uh, hear the last question because we were just clarifying that. Sorry, Councillor Farouk. Sorry, can I just come back on that? Because we, we've just been given an answer by the deputy leader of the council, which the leader of the council has now contradicted. Because, so is he saying then that what we're going to be asked to do at f at f when we get to full council is give the cabinet a blank check to, cl to actually close any, l any libraries that they want to? I could answer that. He, he, he said that it will go through another council meeting where you'll have full, full right to vote on it. So, Councillor Nawaz. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Two-part question. Uh, the first part is page 49. Uh, we've identified VAT and business rate savings of between 500,000 to 700,000 pounds. May I have a breakdown of uh, how much is VAT and how much is business rate relief? I, I don't think I've got those figures to hand immediately, Councillor Nawaz. Um, I think it's a, a proportion of where it might be. Um, there's some work still to be done about all of that. But, um, uh, Adrian Chapman, can you answer that question? Uh, well, actually, I'll just repeat what you said, Councillor Coles. Actually, this is a, an estimate based on um, the information that uh, is available to us, based on the a number of uh, buildings that uh, Peter Limited 
slash vivacity operate on our behalf. So it's a broad estimate um, and of course is subject to them securing charitable status, which is a work in progress. Thank you. I'll ask my second part of the question if I may, Chair. So on the face of it, uh, we're saving on paying business rates to the council. So on one hand, we won't be paying. On the other hand, we won't be receiving. So where's the net gain uh, on this councillor Coles or Adrian Chapman? So, so if I might just step in, the, yeah. the, um, this is the net figure after the um, deficit um, effect is felt within the local authority. Um, so this is um, the uh, additional revenue, if you like, that's generated after um, our pressure, which is, uh, you're quite right, the flip side of uh, Aragon being given rate relief is um, factored in. Thank, thank, thank you, Adrian. Councillor Day. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is about P Peter Museum, Art Gallery and Flagfen Archaeological Site. Um, uh, I've not just been a teacher, I've also worked in the museum and heritage sector, both in the city and up in Northumberland and at Castle. Um, and it says about us reducing these attractions, um, well, the, the cost of reducing these attractions by 50%, and we're going to have to review how the facilities operate, and we're talking about reductions in opening times, but we're also talking about investigating how the attractions could generate more income. Um, what you often see, if you reduce opening times um, and investment into those attractions, you usually can't make more income or you can't generate income. Um, and, you know, unless you're doing something really clever. I mean, a few years ago, I heard that we'd found a Viking longboat somewhere and that the flag fen site, if it was stone, would be as, you know, as, as important as, as um, Stonehenge. So anyway, I just wondered if we've got some vision about how can we operate those sites, you know, with 50% uh, cuts and, and, um, and, and reductions in opening times. Thank you. Councillor Cox. It's great to hear from someone who actually knows about museums for once and knows the reality. Of course, it's a short-term plan, so it's a short-term saving to reach financial sustainability, and then there's a whole load of effort then to bring things back into action. But, um, Adrian, can I turn to you? Yes, thank you very much, and uh, I might well contact you offline and uh, pick your brains, actually, which would be really helpful. We share the vision, actually, so um, what we're setting out in the budget, obviously, is um, a situation which we're all familiar with. We need to save money, and this is one way to do it. But if we can avoid uh, uh, reducing opening hours uh, in lieu of finding commercial opportunities, we will do so. As Councillor Allen has described, if we can avoid closing libraries by looking at commercial opportunities, we will do so, um, because that's not the game we want to be in. Um, and certainly the vision for both of those uh, assets, those, both those facilities, is, is very ambitious. Flagfen has the potential to be a world-leading site. Um, it's never been realised for one reason or another, uh, and I think when our backs are against the wall, it's the time to really seriously take stock and work out whether or not we can actually realise that opportunity, and if we can't find, or find somebody that can or work with somebody that can. And I think it's the same with the museum. It's a little gem. Uh, it's tucked away in a beautiful building, and I would imagine most Peterborians have probably been in it once in their lives. We don't have a turnover of displays. We don't have exhibitions of any great significance, barring the current uh, exhibition, which costs quite a lot of money to go and visit. So I think we've got high ambitions as part of the culture strategy work. Um, what we're setting out here is clearly the, the worst-case scenario, the realistic scenario, should we not be able to materialise an alternative. But believe me, if we can keep them open, and indeed push them even harder, we will do. Thank, thank you, Adrian. <laughs> Councillor Kayum, did you want to come back? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to refer to page 56 with regards to Clare Lodge. Um, it was stated in the previous budget scrutiny meeting that Clare Lodge actually offers us a financial incentive. I see here on page 56 that there's been a loss of income, um, and partly because there is, um, we're, we're recruiting more agency staff. I don't know how advertising works. That's not clear. I'm not sure whether the local authority advertises, but if not, isn't there any scope in working in partnership with Clare Lodge to use council platforms to put out those vacancies so that we can prevent charging, uh, being charged by agencies to, to sort of, you know, fill, fill the backlog, as it were. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cox? Another interesting inquiry from someone who knows about it. Um, can I turn to Lou Williams, please? Um, so the loss of income is against um, a, an overall income target of around a million. So Clare Lodge would still be making money 
it's, it's what we're saying is that it can't make as much money as it has done in the past. And some of that is about a, a change of clientele, a change of the type of referral. Uh, the young people in Clare Lodge are much more complicated and complex and have much more challenging needs than they had two to three years ago. And that's reflected then in terms of pressures on staffing, uh, which has been combined actually through, uh, uh, sorry, has been um, uh, com uh, compounded by the COVID situation. So we've had higher levels of sickness and that's where the agency staff comes in. So it's not about recruiting agency staff to cover permanent posts. It's because we have sickness in Clare Lodge and you have to have a certain, cat a certain ratio of staff to young people for the home to safely operate. And so we have to use agency staff to fill those gaps. So there's a double-edged sword, if you like, in terms of the, uh, the cost base has gone up a little bit uh, and the income base has come down a bit. Thank, thank you, Lou. Councillor Sanford. Yes, thank you. I'll ask my, ask, ask my question number two, which is about the reduction in management of trees. Um, I think I've, se I've seen some comments that other councillors have, have m m made, which are ex expressing concerns that, you know, this could mean that trees that are um, posing some sort of threat or that people may perceive are posing a threat um, may not get maintenance work carried out. And I just wanted to point out as somebody who knows a little bit, bit, bit about trees that it's by no means a precise um, um, science. So you, you, you can't have a situation where a tree suddenly goes from being entirely safe to being entirely um, hazardous. So I, 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 just ha I have yeah. concerns about this, but the specific question that, that I've got it, it is that I was talking to somebody in this service that's responsible for this expenditure, and they seem to think that the that, that this budget saving would, 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 would actually also include not being able to replace trees that are taken out. Now, you know, the, 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 the Question, please, council, council has just agreed ambitious tree planting targets. I think we accept that they can't be taken forward as quickly as perhaps we may have hoped. But if we're not going to replace trees that are taken out, we are going to see a long-term decline in, in, in the tree population. So can we have some, cl some clarity over what this, over what, what is actually going to happen as a result of this? Who is going to answer the hypothetical question? Hypothetical question. If, if I may start, um, it's a, it's a short-term tactical budget. We've got to make savings. We've um, asked for the assessment of risk about what might be safe to do, um, and so anything that's an emergency or a health and safety risk will be dealt with. Um, it's great to have another expert, actually. So, I mean, if, if you've got any advice about how you should do it and still make the savings, Councillor Sanford, please, please come forward with them, because I'd um, be very interested to hear what, what, what you, you've got to add. But in terms of the, the detail, I mean, Adrian Chapman, are you going to be able to answer this one? Yep, yeah, thank you, Councillor Sanford. Um, I, I absolutely echo um, the initial response from Councillor Coles that um, this is not, not in any way, um, uh, will not prevent us from dealing with um, known or emerging health and safety issues, of course, and I completely ac accept as well that some of those issues may not always be evident. Um, just to give you some order of magnitude, the um, annual budget for uh, tree maintenance is £900,000, so there remains £650,000 in the budget to uh, look after our tree stock, and, and it is a one-year only saving. We've made that very clear, and we're just writing uh, some detailed uh, business cases right now and have written into that business case the requirement for that budget to go back in again um, in 23-24. And, and this, is, this relates to stock management only, uh, not to provision of new stock. So um, I would not expect the um, new stock commitments to be affected in any way by this uh, temporary, temporary reduction. Thank, thank you, Adrian. Councillor Knight. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's um, page 49, the on all, uh, unauthorised encampments. Um, in the report it says the actual amount spent has been lower in recent years. Um, just curious whether or not that's because of COVID and lockdown or is it places are well defended at the minute? Councillor Coles. Uh, to Adrian Chapman on this one, I think. Thank you very much. It's um, 
very much the latter of those two scenarios. So we've got a, a city now which um, has had its fair share, of course, of unauthorised encampments. Um, we've invested well, I think, in the city to protect uh, community spaces that have been affected in this way. That it leaves very few options now for um, travellers um, who aren't working with us to go on to authorised sites. Um, uh, COVID has certainly helped, but this goes back five or six years now. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd ask you to look out for is new legislation that's emerging anyway, which will, I think will help probably to drive that cost down even further um, if that uh, goes through Parliament. Thank, thank you, Adrian. Councillor Joseph. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've had a lot of talk, obviously, about the uh, leisure and culture uh, offering the city has and talk about vision and one of the cross-party visions we've had um, and argued about on whose idea idea of initiative it was was the city of culture does this mean with the cuts in spending etc this is no longer something that is on the table as pre other cities that have um, obviously won this award have seen massive uh, input um, in investment and have seen increased spending through tourism etc so what's the plans now for the City of Culture? Councillor Allen. And Adrian Chapman again, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Joseph. I think, in a way, you answered your own question, actually, because I think the economic argument um, is very compelling. Cities, as you know that, and have rightly said, that have uh, secured City of Culture status have seen exponential increases in economic growth as a consequence. Visitors, visitor attractions, uh, uh, visitors coming to the city, uh, bars, uh, restaurants, hotels uh, succeeding, shops uh, selling more. It's a, bit, it's a little bit of a no-brainer. And actually, the uh, culture strategy that we've uh, just adopted as a council is a city strategy, not a city council strategy. Um, city of Culture will require all of the um, city's uh, culture and um, arts and heritage organisations, um, investors, developers, um, hotels, businesses to, to come together to put forward a really compelling case. It's our aspiration, as set out in that strategy, to aim to bid for City of Culture status for 2029. It takes a good few years to build a, a compelling case, um, uh, and fortunately we're not going to be first, so we can follow others, uh, do it our own way. So, yeah, everything is lining up well uh, for that to happen as part of our economic uh, recovery strategy actually and also building on the inward investment that's been happening in the city for a few years providing more hotel rooms for example is a big part of what we need to do thank you thank you Adrian. councillor Fitzgerald did you want to elaborate on that uh, uh, no no I think uh, Adrian Chapman said all of that uh, I think the question was about aspiration and vision we have it we just can't realise it today, uh, and even if we could uh, financially, we wouldn't be in a position to. I just want to make clear, it's always been 2029. It's not uh, as was mooted last year with the Mayor of Cambridge uh, uh, thinking about a county of culture. That, that wasn't anything to do with us. Uh, so uh, the aspiration remains. Whether or not we can get there, we have to go back to where Andy started, Council Call started, which is about growth and investment. That's our salvation. Thank, thank you. Councillor Haynes. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question um, continues from Councillor Kayum's question about Clare Lodge. Um, I'm not sure if it'll end up as a question or a suggestion, I'm not sure. I worked at Clare Lodge a few years ago for several years, not on the care front uh, as a teacher, so I didn't face sort of the worst challenges that they had. Um, and my impression always was that they were quite good at recruiting, getting in lots of really keen, enthusiastic, dedicated staff. It was the turnover of injuries and sickness that was the problem. I was just wondering um, if it could be clarified, these high number of agency staff, are they simply covering short-term temporary sickness um, due to the nature of the work with the girls and uh, is it possible to kind of review and offer more support to try and prevent these keen enthusiastic dedicated skilled professionals from leaving when uh, you know they face some of the difficult challenges the workers do face thank you thank you Councillor Haynes. Councillor turn to Lou Williams on the question of burnout yeah thank you and you're absolutely right it is a tough very tough job uh, to be a, a care worker at Clare Lodge it, in, in all honesty it will be a combination of things. Um, as I said earlier, but perhaps um, not, um, I perhaps didn't speak clearly enough, a large amount of sickness at the moment has been COVID related. We are seeing uh, significant le levels of absences in our staff currently in Clare Lodge, which is around COVID, and that has been a pattern previously. 
Um, you'll be aware that we do try and put in an awful lot of support in terms of uh, staff and staff training. Um, but it is you know, also the case that the complexity of needs of the young women in, in Clare Lodge has um, become much more uh, complicated, much more significant, and that in turn has had an impact in terms of you know, staff finding it quite difficult sometimes to, to go into work and so on. So it's a whole mix of things. We, we, we support staff uh, as, as far as we possibly can. We're always looking to uh, get some suggestions, so perhaps we could talk offline, or at least a colleague of mine might be able to talk offline to pick your brains a bit further about that. Thank, thank you, Lou. Thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Robinson. Thank you. My question is relating to page 47 and children's services um, on the topic of reunification. Um, I do feel the review of reunification rates actually has merit as outcomes are better for children who spend less time in care. But at an earlier meeting, I think it was Nicola Curley touched on that it was more to do with services often feel happy with placements once um, you know they've been running for a while and don't perhaps look again if things could be rejudged and I see that as an issue nationally but now I hear you saying Mr Williams that it's about um, moving cases on quicker who were likely already uh, to go home I generally see social workers working really hard on new cases to wrap that up so my question is is there confidence that the team has sufficient staff capacity to do extra work in a shorter time frame to ready parents um, for reunification? Uh, Thank you for the question. To Lou Williams, please. Yes, yeah, so um, the, the truth of this matter is that there will be different types of children, different ages of children and young people that we'll be talking about here. So, and we'll be talking about actually very small numbers, relatively speaking. Um, very often, what we're talking about is older young people who have been in care for a little while, uh, but who have grown older. Uh, they've remained in contact with their family. Their family may have made sufficient changes over that time to be able to provide safe care for them again. They are older themselves, which increases their or reduces some of the risks that they might be facing. And it's about helping social workers uh, and others think more quickly perhaps or sooner about is this now the time to start thinking about this young person going home because their family their birth family will be their forever family no matter how good a foster carer is they won't be their forever family so i think that's where we're going with this it's not about needing to have more capacity or more services it's about needing to think a little bit differently about some of those young people and perhaps thinking about um yeah, but uh, taking the step a little bit more quickly. Thank, thank you, Lou. We're allowing more time on this section as this contains more more savings or more cuts. So, so we're uh, next, Councillor Shaznavaz. Thank you, Chair. Two-part question again, if I may. Uh, page 50 on the contract and procure procurement services for save savings. Uh, it says that there's an assumption that will make uh, savings of 1.7 million pounds. Keen to understand what those assumptions are based on. Councillor Coles. Can I turn to Will Patton? You've been able to answer that question. It's a, a question on the savings on contracts and procurement. The 1.7 on page 50. Oh, marker. 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 Councillor Seresti. Uh, thank you, Chairman. It's very, very simple. Uh, we we have 330 odd thousand, uh, 330 odd million pounds worth of uh, contracts, which we uh, purchase every year. Um, as soon as I took over uh, the portfolio, uh, we inst we agreed and instigated a review of every single contract. We are at the moment in the process of going through 250 of those contracts and there's over three there's well over 300 of them and um, we are doing that in the air because we don't know exactly how much we will be able to save and I think the 1.7 million is very conservative um, it wouldn't be unreasonable to say well you know why can't we make 5% savings on the 330 million but let's say 1.7 million, and then if we come back with 5 million, we'll all be, we'll all be better off, won't we? At, at the moment, I'm afraid, that's where we're at. We're going through every single one. Process has gone through 
to CMT. We're waiting now for CMT to send out notification to all heads and directors so that they know now what to expect and what's required of them in the changes in the procurement system. We anticipate that will go out in the next few days and we should be ready to rock and roll within the next fortnight. Thank you, Councillor Soresti. Councillor Collins, did you want to come back? Perhaps we should also turn to Cecilia because I, know, I appreciate she's online and may be able to, to also um, respond to that question. Yes, I'm happy to come in. If, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, we are, uh, as Councillor Seresta has just uh, outlined, we are looking at all uh, procurement contracts and, and possibly looking at the way we procure as well. Working very closely with Serco, um, who are fairly confident that we're going to meet uh, the 1.7 million savings target, probably more as well. So there's a, a very detailed review that has already started. Th thank you. Uh, and your Part B question? Thank you, uh, Chair. Part B was obviously uh, 1.7 million into uh, 170 million is 1%. Uh, and can we achieve further savings, or is this just a starting point? But Councillor Chuesh has already covered that point, so thank you, Chair. Thank you. Finally, I have Councillor Sanford. Did you have a, another question on that? Yes, I did. I've deliberately left this one until the end because it's it's actually quite a small amount, but I think it illustrates a, a, an important principle. I'm looking at Aragon Direct Services, £41,000. There are three bullet points that there, um, but I, I just wanted to ask, could we have a breakdown of how much is actually going to be saved by this? Because the b bottom one, it says th um, 13000 I think that bullet point number two um, from previous budget reports that we've had about the idea of replacing the wildflower areas with um, grass, I've got a feeling that figure is around about 10,000. But could I ask that we reconsider this because it's, um, you know, the, it, it actually links in with the, with the point that, I'm, that I actually make quite often that the council budget should be supporting what the policies and priorities of the Council are one of the one of the strategies the council had is is a biodiversity um, strategy. Um, having increased amount of wildflower areas, or at least not removing the ones that we had, will support our biodiversity strategy. I actually really do question how this is going sorry, to save the amount of. Sorry, can, Councillor. Can you let me question, finish the question? question is how please? are we achieving the savings? Is the question is how are we achieving those savings through Aragon? The, the question is, are we, are, we, are we confident that this, that this 10,000 can be saved? Because when somebody puts in a report that you're going to manually weed a, a, a sort of wildflower area, it makes me think that they don't actually know what they're talking about. about. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Sanford. It is a question of detail. If I could turn to James Collingridge, please. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Coles. Yeah, so the wildflower areas that we're looking at are the um, annual wildflower areas. So these are not your standard ones where you would plant an annual seed and leave to, just to, to go wild during the year. So these are ones at the side of the road that you would have seen replaced bedding plants a few years ago. So we've got some, some select sites across the city. So those are planted with annual wildflowers. So we have to weed them, otherwise the weed species will overtake the, the wildflowers that give the vibrant colour. So at the moment we're paying about £1.55p a square metre to plant those wildflowers, whereas just a standard grass cut, the G8 grass cut, we're looking at more like 5p a square metre. So that's where the saving comes there. But we are working closely with you, um, groups to put in other wildflower areas. We've got community groups now planting wildflower areas on our land. And we're also liaising with other groups now to look at if they want to take over some of these areas to continue to plant them as wildflowers. Thank you. Thank you. Jane. Just to briefly come back on that, because, you know, it, I don't know of anywhere else in the country that sows wildflower areas and actually weeds them, because it's a contradiction in, in, in terms. I'm, I'm also aware of the fact that Peterborough Environment City Trust has funding that is available for, for precisely this purpose. So, so actually go and talk to them. Can I? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, James. Councillor Sam, just say I'm meeting PECT on Friday. That's who we're liaising with. That pleased you. 
Right. I don't seem to have any more questions. Any? Councillor Hemrach. Hi, it's um, page 46 on the reablement. Will the savings still be made if they're unable to recruit staff? Because I know there's major recruitment issues in the social care sector. And will this still be a six-week package or would this be likely reduced? And the second question is about the interim beds. I understand reading the document, document, you're closing some of the interim beds, but the population is getting older. So if a resident actually does need an interim bed and that's full, what would happen with that resident or patient? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, we'll turn to you on that question. Yes. Certainly, thank you for the question. So um, the point that you make about the beds, uh, we have reviewed the beds and how frequently those beds are used, the utilisation level, <clears throat> and we've found that uh, they're actually underutilised and so as a result of that we're decommissioning some of those beds. Um, as far as your question about reablement, uh, the term is still six weeks. Uh, we are actively recruiting into, into the service. We've run a number of really successful recruitment campaigns. As Charlotte has said earlier, it's an amazing service um, and uh, any support that members can give to help us to recruit into those services would be very welcome. And just, just to finish that off, I mean, you're quite right, it's a pressure that if we don't achieve it, it will be an in year pressure, we'll need to sort it. So, yeah, any, any members here who can think of someone who might be able to take on the role would like to apply, then please, please encourage them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coles. So if there's no questions, do we have any recommendations on Appendix B, please? No? Members, can everyone note that we are now considering Appendix C, Capital Programme Schemes 2022-23 to 2024-25, starting on page 67 to 70. Would any member of the Cabinet like to present it or straight to questions? Straight to questions. Do we have any questions on Capital Programme Schemes? Councillor Sanford, would you like to go ahead? Yes, it's just a question on page 68. Um, I, I, we've, we've actually been told that the Community Leadership Fund has actually been terminated, yet it's it, 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 yet, yet there's, an, there's an amount of 60,000 appears in the capital pro, um, programme. So I just, just wanted to ask what the reason is that that, that that's actually in there and and a sort of question that leads on from that is that we were told the purpose of freezing capital spending was so that we don't have to b b borrow the money to pay for it but i understand that the community leadership fund comes from section 106 contributions and um so so could someone explain why the community leadership fund has been terminated Thank you, Councillor Sanford. Councillor Coles? Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sanford. Not, not terminated, suspended, because all capital spend was for the year, as you'll remember, and it is a capital spend. And uh, your second part about it coming from 106 money, well, yes, that's the case, but it could also be spent on other community projects, not necessarily through the Councillor's £1,000 fund each. There may be other funds, uh, sorry, other projects that we could spend that money on that, that benefit the community that may not necessarily touch there. Um, and yes, and, and the leader's reminding me, in the future, this line might not remain in the budget. It's, it's still up for discussion. Thank you, Councillor Coles. Do we have any more questions on Appendix C? No? In that case, do we have any recommendations on this section, please? No? Can everyone note that we are now considering Appendix D, Financial Risk Register, starting on page 71 to 80, please. Did any Cabinet member want to introduce or straight to questions? Straight to questions. Members, do we have questions on... Yeah, Councillor Sanford? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm asking a question on page 78, which is the um, a actual item in the risk register on climate change. Now, I'd just like to preface what I'm saying is I think it's really good that we, that we have climate change identified as a risk. But anybody who knows anything about c climate change will know there are t two aspects to it. One is reducing carbon emissions and the, 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 the other one is actually adaptation. Now, it's, it's actually n noticeable that in the sort of answer where it gives what the council is doing to, to tackle the climate risk, it talks about the adaptation plan, but it doesn't say anything about reducing carbon em em emissions. So does that mean that we aren't actually doing anything to, to, to reduce carbon emissions? Councillor Collins. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think, Councillor Sanford, it's a victim of some summarisation. If you'd like the full document, please um, ask and I'll make sure it gets to you. Thank you. Do we have any more question on financial risk register, please? If there's no questions, do we have any recommendation on this section? No recommendations? Okay. Can everyone note that we are now considering Appendix E? Fees and charges starting on page 81 to 88, please. Shall we go straight to questions, Councillor Colts? Straight to questions, please. Councillor Sanford and then Councillor Kayu. Yeah, um, I, I think we, we've actually been told that all of the documents that have been presented to us have been discussed by the Financial Sustainability Group. I don't recall the document on fees and charges actually going to one of those one of those groups. Um, so just wanted to, 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 wanted to, to ask what the reason for that is. But also um, the, earlier on in the meeting, when when I was challenging the leader over climate change, he said, "Can you quote an example of where you would change expenditure?" Well, one, in the area of transport, one of, one of the ways of doing that would be to increase charges on things that we want to that we don't want to encourage which is people driving cars and actually use that money to spend on things that we do want to want to encourage like active tra um, tra um, travel so can I just ask then why are the c car parking charges not being increased it actually says that the increase is zero percent zero percent if you, as the Liberal Democrat leader, Councillor Sanford, want to bring a suggestion to the next FSWG about raising car parking charges, you're most welcome to do so. And any other charges that you may feel are applicable or appropriate, whether it's on climate change or anything else, as I said, this process includes you and others. So if you want to bring something, bring it. If you want to make a recommendation tonight, make the recommendation but be specific how much whether it's an amount is a percentage you need to know what it is so you may not want to do it tonight you might want to bring it to the next group when you've thought about it thank you so you can just come back on that because i did specifically ask at a meeting of the financial sustainability group when we were going to get an opportunity to have a look at the document with the with the fees and charges in it and we haven't actually, so I, I can't actually propose things on things that we haven't seen, can, can I? Uh, well, as a matter of principle, you can. In terms of, uh, I'll take your word for it, Councillor Sanford, about fees and charges, but bearing in mind, the budget process has not ended. This is a work in progress. So your comments, I've heard them, and you could have asked about the very thing you've asked about, um, before, but it doesn't matter. It's no big deal. You can bring it forward to the next group. Absolutely fine. I think Councillor Sanford's first question was about is it going to appear at FSWG? Next uh, I've, time? I've just said so, yeah. Councillor Farouk. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just getting uh, be, because we, we, we've been dealing with a lot of stuff. 
every single detail, such as fees and charges, although it's a big thing, it may not have come, or it may not have been presented to everybody, and in turn the wider uh, members of groups. Cause, so uh, we're quite happy to look at anything. I'm being perfectly clear about it. If you want to make a proposal, look through the fees and charges, you've got it here tonight, and, and bring some forward. That's absolutely fine. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cahill. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to draw the member's attention to the increase in fees for cemetery, um, the cemetery fees. And I think that many councillors here cross-party have become aware of some of the waterlogging that's taking place when um, individuals are laying their loved ones to rest, especially on the Muslim side of the cemetery. Um, my request in earnest is that we have a look at this because there are a lot of distressed individuals, a lot of individuals, we've seen an exponential rise in deaths, um, and I'm very happy for us to work cross-party on this to bring some suggestions to the FSWG to see whether this could be revisited, please, until a solution is brought about with respect to the water logging because it's very distressing laying a loved one in a grave that is waterlogged and, and has water inside it. So that's something I just would rather like to bring to the members' attention, if I may. Thank you. James Colin Ridge, is that being looked at at Aragon? Or? It, it, I don't think it is, Councillor Farouk, but I, I, I will answer because I think we mustn't conflate the two things together. Councillor Kayyem, I understand entirely exactly what you're saying, and I'm aware of it, and it is distressing. I think the increase in fees is, is the fees to do with the carrying out of the services required in line with inflation and everything else. But I do understand that that is a problem, and many members do, particularly uh, within that community. How we solve it, I don't think, is a fees and charges issue, but I think it's something that in the longer term we should maybe find another solution for. So I absolutely get it, I do. But I don't. I think the increases are in the increases in the staffing and, 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 and everything that goes with it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald. Uh, Councillor Himraj first, and Councillor Nimaz. Yeah, it's the... Um so the disband the tourist information centre and the redundancy costs. Obviously, the staff probably don't know that don't do. this is going to close until after the, the after the um, the council meeting. But has there been alternative um, jobs been found for these staff to try and save redundancy costs? Thank Councillor you. Cox. To Councillor on this one, please. Uh, the post is to go. The service is to be maintained, and uh, that will be maintained by a desk at the town hall, and indeed uh, uh, perhaps a more um, all-embracing uh, service at the central library. But the post is to go, and that is a proposal. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, if you want. Yeah. So, will alternative um, suitable employment in within the council be found for low staff without? Paying out the redundant without putting the staff at risk of redundancy. Thank you. There is one member of staff, not staff, and due and proper process will have been followed about redundancy. And if the council and I, and I don't know what's happened to the individual, um, the the we have one post, but due and proper process would have been followed. And if alternative employment was available and part of the contractual requirements of the council, I'm sure that would have been followed. Uh, that's all I can say because I'm not involved in the individual case, but we have employment and HR processes and they would have been followed. Thank, thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald. Councillor Nemaz. Thank you, uh, Chair. Page 81, uh, Hacking Carriage Licensing Fees. Uh, I'm just interested to find out why uh, the Hacking Carriage Licensing Fees are one of the highest increases uh, on this entire table in view of the fact that uh, there's been a, a huge increase in fuel costs, insurance costs, and it's an industry which is really struggling to make ends meet. Uh, and alongside that, obviously, if there's an incre increase of 4.1%, uh, I understand that the council sets the tariffs. Uh, is there an intention to increase the fixed rate tariff for Hackney carriages in terms of what they charge customers? Councillor Carlton, who would like to answer that, please? I think we're struggling to identify who might be able to... Oh, uh, Adrian Chapman can answer it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Nwaz. The um, increase is based on um, a bit of a levelling up 
uh, arrangement. But with your permission, I'll arrange for a short briefing note to be prepared for all members, particularly on the fixed tariff rates, which I understand have just increased. Um, so there, there has been an allowance made already to support the trade. But, but let me get you the actual details and circulate a note to all members. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Adrian. We don't have any more questions on this, so do we have any recommendation? No? We move on. Can everyone note that we are now considering Appendix F, F reserves commitment starting on page 83 to 84? Uh, do we go straight to questions? Yeah. Do we have any questions on reserve commitments? Please. No, no questions. In that case, there's no recommendations, presumably. No recommendations. Can everyone note that we are now considering Appendix G, Equality Impact Assessment, starting on page 85, and Appendix H, Carbon Impact Assessment Summary, starting on page 121. So this is page 85 to 120 and 121 to 124. Uh, I presumably will go straight to questions. Do we have any questions? We'll start with Councillor Sanford. Yes, I'd like to refer to the, to the um, impact assessment on page 92, uh, which is talking about the public library closures. And um, it's, it says, it, it looks at the series of groups, and the, the, and, the, and the group it identifies that are going to be particularly adversely impacted are older people and students. Now, so I'd just like to, to ask the Cabinet, um, if libraries are closed, what measures will they put in place to, to ensure that older people and students aren't adversely affected? I think that, Councillor Sandford, would largely depend on you and everybody else in the room to shape library services in the future for all people. But I know we're talking about increased use of technology, and access uh, a, a, a very state-of-the-art mobile library for people that can't access already um, libraries. So look, again, I want to be clear, it's up to members to shape the future of the library service, not the cabinet. The cabinet will make decisions, but the decisions will be informed by members representing residents. So there may be no cuts to library services if it turns out that actually everybody needs a library in wherever they are and everybody's using them. So all we're doing is making a commitment to look root, root and branch and members can shape the future service of libraries, not just the cabinet. Thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald. Any more questions on Appendix G? Or H. Any recommendations on Appendix H or G? No? Can everyone note that we are now considering Appendix I, Peterborough Improvement Plan, 2021 to 2024, starting on page 125 to 156, please. Do we go straight to questions again, Councillor Coles? Yeah, questions? Do we have questions on Peterborough Improvement Plan, please? Only that it's not the improvement plan that we agree. That's not. <laughs> but, but we all know what we know. Yeah. Okay. Without further ado, then, in that case, we, do we have any recommendation on this if we have no questions? No recommendations? Can everyone note that we're now considering Appendix G? Dedicated Schools Grant and the Schools Budget 2022-23, starting on page 157 to 168. Do we have any questions on Dedicated Schools Grant and the Schools Budget, please? No? In that case, do we have any recommendations? No recommendations, presumably? Okay. Can everyone note that we are now considering Appendix K, Treasury Management st <coughs> Strategy 2022-23 to 2024-25, starting on page 169 
to 198, please. Do we have any questions on Treasury management? No. Do we have any recommendations on Treasury management? No. That ends all the agenda items. So. If, if we have any further comments or recommendations on any of those items or anything. If we're finished, Councilor I was just going to give a comment, yeah. Councillor Farouk, yeah. if, if there so, are no members or other uh, yeah, items. So, so again, uh, ju just to reiterate that setting this budget this year is more important than ever. And, you know, if people don't want to see it the way I see it or other people see it, that's absolutely fine. But the council must come together on March the 2nd and agree a balanced budget. And what I would also extend to uh, members, not just of the FSWG, because what we, what we talk about there, um, it's, 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 you know, we, we try to thrash out the detail, which then members will approve. But if people have ideas about what should be in the budget, that's great, come bring them forward. And if you don't like something that's in the budget, then let your reps know or let somebody know. But remember this, if you want something in, you've got to take something out. We are at a balanced budget now with severe risks to that budget. And the risks are in realizing the savings. And everything that we don't do, whether it be libraries or whether we don't close the museum, we don't close Flag Fen or, or, or cut the hours down, it just adds in-year pressure to the budget. But we, the cabinet, the administration, are listening to everybody's point of view. And if you want to talk about it, it's not too late. As I said, we, we, the CLF may or may not be there because we may not be able to afford it. It depends what comes up because we started off with 790,000 as, as a wriggle room, we'll call it. It's gone down to just 300,000 because of in-year pressures that appear. As the weeks roll by, the team, you know, with Matt leading the team now and Cecilia, who's online, as our new Section 151, and Kirsty, as you know, has been doing an incredible job as the rest of the finance team, but it's difficult, challenging work. So I'm just saying again for the record, because this meeting is for the record, you are all welcome to input into the budget process but be mindful of what I said. It needs to be zero. Thank you, Thank, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Fussell. Well, okay. May I make an observation? Uh, I'll just carry on. I think we'll leave it to the Council meeting on the 2nd of March. Well, uh, I think there's yeah. something that uh, Councillor Fitzgerald has said, which sits uncomfortably with me. That is, there was an agreement for us to uh, be part of the FSWG, but there was never any agreement or any discussion about us supporting the budget. Now, of course, it's up to every group and uh, their members to decide whether they wish to support the budget or not. Uh, so I don't think it, it's helpful for you, Councillor Fitzgerald, to in instruct other groups what they should or shouldn't do. I did not do that. And, uh, I, and I, I think it's also unhelpful, really, if you're talking about working together and collaboration, where we have a, a point at FSWG, I'll keep it brief, Chair, uh, where the in instruction was to keep everything confidential. And then you go out to the media and say, oh, the opposition groups aren't really supporting us. They're not giving us any ideas. You, 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 can, you can't have it both ways. Have it one way or the other. Uh, but if you have these conversations, okay. I think it's, it's better we have this conversation at FSWG than in an open forum. All right. There's an ex I didn't, I didn't, there's no instruction. Sorry, Councillor Farouk. What I'm saying is there is an expectation, not from me, do what you like, from others. The chief executive has made it clear. The chairman of the panel has made it clear. The reports to the council have made it clear. If you want to ignore that advice, then ignore it at your peril. As for me making comments, everything I commented about is as a result of comments in the newspaper and of published documents. Nothing I have spoken about has not been in the public domain already. And Councillor Joseph said it wasn't a collaborative group. In, in our all-party policy, 
I, I, I sincerely think it is a collaborative group. And all I'm saying is, if it is, then own the budget. If you don't want to do that, that's a matter for you. It's an expectation of others, not mine. I'm being perfectly clear. I try to be genuine and open about it. Take it as you will. Well, scrutiny went well today. I was nearly patting myself back on this one before this discussion started. Should, should be... Uh, look, uh, I'm not going to allow Councillor Sanford, but Councillor Joseph's name was mentioned, so Councillor Joseph... But you're not, so you're not going to allow me to respond to the uh, comments that he's th making, then? That, that is ridiculous. Okay. But let's let Councillor Joseph speak for a second. Yeah, I think it's only fair, Chair, that if you're going to allow the Leader to come back on comments, that you allow the rest of us. However, look, I mean... The, the fact that about it being collaborative is that we feel that, you know, we're constantly being told you're not coming up with ideas, you're not coming up with ideas. We do want to um, obviously work and uh, come up with ideas, but let's be, let's be fair, clear and very fair about it. In order to sit with the officers and to go through the different, um, you know, remits of each officer, to look at all the different cost spendings, that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of um, effort, not only on the part of those who are doing it, which in this case is the cabinet and officers as well. Now, as Councillor Fitzgerald said at full council, he feels very justified in taking his 33k every year to to be leader and to, you know spend time looking at these sort of things and yet he expects us to come up, up with ideas for free so perhaps the recommendation should be that councillor Fitzgerald offers two hundred thousand pounds to opposition leaders to give them the ability to sit in and with officers and go through every single piece of spending yeah okay well thank you all right councillor sanford i'm going to allow you you say a few words and then we'll call it a day okay i, I just need to be absolutely clear you know I, I did a number of years ago i did a course on the british constitution at peterborough regional college and i would, I would commend it to Councillor Fitzgerald, it's really good because what what it tells you about is in in the British Constitution you have a you you you, you have a either a government or an administration and you have an opposition. Now, we are part of the opposition. If Councillor Fitzgerald doesn't accept that, then that's entirely up to him. We are quite happy, I've, I've said this repeatedly, to engage with him about the budget to make constructive comments, but we're not going to accept instructions from Kemi Badenoch or from him as to how we should vote when it comes to, when we, when it, when we come to the vote on this. That is not part of how the British Constitution operates. Thank, thank you. Look, look, thank you for participating in this scrutiny. Have a safe journey home and thank you.